outro cast. Bill, thank you so much for doing this. Big admirer of your radio work and also your mainstream work. Thank Both you. Both of those things. And congratulations on this documentary. Were you at all hesitant to put yourself out there with the documentary? Um when you have somebody else producing and directing a documentary about yourself, you know, you, you, you're, you're basically saying, okay, I'll let the journalism carry it. Uh, I don't believe that documentaries produced by the subject themselves are, are very honest. I, I just, how can they be, but they could be interesting, but I decided I'd remove myself. Um, I never really insisted on being a part of it, but yeah, I thought, you know, I don't know what these guys are going to say, say about me. Um, I think it was pretty fair. I, I didn't know that I was so handsome. You know, I mean, I just, wow, I mean, knock, I it did, out, but... knock it out of the park with some of those shots, man. They're just, you know, yeah. Uh, but other than that, you know, I thought it was, it was, it was Pat and Jordan's view of me. And both those guys, those guys are good friends and they, they, they like my work. So, you know, let it speak for itself, I guess, that way. Did they start the documentary before they asked you if you approved of it? No, they, uh, we sat down, we had lunch um, and, and they don't like me continually going down this road, but they have an office at Santa Monica Airport. There's a whole row of entertainment and filmmaker offices at Santa Monica Airport. I don't know why that is. You know, maybe the private jets they're landing or something. You know, so we had lunch there, and they said we want to do this this movie. I said, "Wow, that's I mean, it's it's kind of kind of a gas when anybody says I'd like to do a doc about you." And I said, "Sure," you know, and uh, and and that's where it began. You know, with them sitting and asking, you know, what would I think about that? I guess I could have said no, but why? Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to these kinds of documentaries that are kind of life spanning and career spanning, sometimes there's red tape where it's like, oh, this library, this radio station, et cetera, doesn't want to give the rights to it. In this case, were they able to license everything that they wanted to for it? Yeah, I own everything. Um, I own everything done originally when I was on Clear Channel um, that had been Cox Broadcasting, that had been AM, FM. Uh, the only thing that I that, that the ownership is a little fuzzy on is the CBS radio stuff when I was a WCCO, but everything after that, I got the rights to. So there and all that stuff's on my website. That that really puts you in rare company. Everyone knows that Howard Stern owns everything, but mm -hmm. I can't think of many broadcasters besides you and Howard that own their stuff. I had good advice. I had uh, advice from my manager at the time, Doug Urbanski, and I had uh, and and Craig Kitchen, who was the head of Premier Radio, said. Sure, we'll let you have this. Um, it was a period of time around 2006 where radio was kind of doing one of these, you know, and podcasting was doing one of these. So I think everybody was beginning to get a little smart with uh, what was going on with their material. And uh, uh, and so, yeah, I was I had good advice and, and we moved on it, you know. 2006, ironically, when Howard left his thing to go to satellite and David Lee Roth ruined uh, commercial radio in like 10 to 15 markets. <laughs> I, I said it because I know you went to Pasadena College. Arcadia, I did go to you. You yeah, have those, those cats are they're from there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I was actually going to work one morning. This is the God's truth. Going to work one morning many years ago, going down Orange Grove to the Pasadena Freeway, and there was this beautiful two tone fifty seven Plymouth convertible with this dude, long blonde hair, just slumped over at the driver's seat, waiting for the light to change. Said, That's David Lee Roth right there, man, coming back from partying all night. But what I basically, what I basically. Uh, uh, said was you know look you know uh radio is 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 not doing well man i mean it was uh uh, uh having a hard time dealing with his advertiser this is a problem that radio had from the very if they dealt with it when the the industry was formed back in the late 40s this commercial right. industry we know of it, it would have been much easier but they didn't and so as a result it was all every man for himself and all of this individual talent was jumping off this sinking ship grabbing what they could and swimming for the shore, basically. Well, if can I keep the compliments coming, or are you maxed out for the day? No, no, as long as they're honest. <laughs> okay. So it fascinates me, your success in your mainstream work has nothing to do with the success of your radio career. And by that, I mean, when you're on radio, it's pretty much just you aside from the callers, and it's improvised, and it's uncensored. And then your mainstream work, it's scripted and somebody else did it and they're telling you what to do. That's what, such what, a what mainstream work are you referring to? Team America, King of the Hill, oh. Judd Apatow puts you into stuff. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'm mean, doing uh, theatrical television film stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and hopefully you get a uh, you get 
put into a, a, a project that really plays to your strengths as an improviser and as a comic. And I think I've been lucky. Team America was great and working with Judd is great. And some shows are not so great, you know, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to stretch and, and be a, a much, much better, um, full service performer that way, you know, and, uh, uh, but it, it, I, I really don't have any choice, man. I have my podcast, my radio broadcast, my, my comedy background, and then you have to keep on, you have to keep on punching. So I jumped into, um, uh, acting, voice acting, camera acting as a way to just keep right on, keep right on, uh, walking, you know. When I watch the videos that you've put out of yourself live for the radio or the podcast, you're not looking at a clock. And, and when I, I point that out, because when I'm doing these Zoom interviews, usually they go like, oh, OK, you got eight minutes. So you got six minutes. So, you know, while you're actively listening, you're going, OK, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. You're doing that kind of a thing. Are you able to just time it all out in your head and magically make the time limits work? Well, you know, there's no time limits anymore. You know, we're not, we're, there's no appointment listening. We're not, uh, you know, it's not Phil Henry at 6 p.m. tonight and then uh, Billy Joe at nine. It's whenever you want it to be. People are downloading when they want to. They're, they're, they're binge listening and watching when they want to. So there is no time. So guys that are looking at the clock, I don't know what that's about. Maybe they have an agreement with an advertiser. Maybe they got to get out of the studio. You know, I did the Sklar Brothers uh, podcast yesterday. Great guys. They're over in Burbank and they're in this massive studio complex, man. Is that the Earwolf? Like, Sorry to rudely interrupt. Is that the Earwolf complex? That's not a, no. They're not at Earwolf. Earwolf anymore. They're over in uh, they're over in Burbank at a other oh. complex. But you know, it didn't look like it. They had their own studio and their own camera set up, and and pretty much they can come and go as they please. So maybe it's not even that. I don't know why somebody would would, would maybe they've just decided I want my podcast to be thirty minutes. Why? Just because just it feels better that way. You know, uh, I've got an egg. If there's boiling eggs, I got to get them <laughs> off the stove. Something like that. You know, so. Uh, I, other than that, I can't imagine why anybody would put a time limit on their podcast. Sometimes you have really anal kind of producers that do think, oh, it's 30 minutes or else, or contractually it's that. And other times you just go, okay, they're going to do six junkets today. So therefore you only have 20 minutes. So <laughs> 20 bless minutes. you for not having to succumb to all yeah. those limitations. Well, the plat my commercial platform is podcast one. Mm -hmm. uh, they have never said, you know, keep it to any uh, time. They do. They put spots into my shows for which I'm eternally grateful, but there's no time limits. In fact, they don't even put time limits on the commercials. That's something else. Remember the old days of 30 and 60 second commercials? They're yes. gone. They're gone. <laughs> you know, especially if you're doing a pitch for an ad, for a sponsor and you want that, to, you'll do two minutes, you know, <laughs> so they're going, let me tell you all about sheath underwear and how it fits me, you know. Uh, so Mid mobile and purple <laughs> carrot mattress or yeah. right on bro. And you know, if, <laughs> if the audience is having fun with it, why not, you know, do a half hour as long as the audience is laughing. So you got it. That's something you have to be, be careful of, but uh, beyond that, no, the time limits are thing of the past. Now your voice is your instrument. Obviously I'm curious if you have to do vocal warm ups and warm downs the way that a singer does at this point in time. That's a really good question. At one time, I had vocal nodules back in the early 80s when I suddenly realized I was hoarse. I had had a bad cold, but the cold went away and I still was kind of, and I, what's that, man? So I went to an ENT. He looked, he said, you have vocal nodules, which are pretty much like calluses on your vocal cords. Yeah. And how do we get rid of calluses? Well, most of the time we just stop doing what we're doing and they go away. And I had a very good speech therapist who said exactly that. I will not recommend you for surgery, Phil. It, injure, it injures the vocal cords. I want you to just start using your voice differently. And I went to him and I began with the whole e e e e e e e e e goo 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 goo. Um, and that was something that I did for about 15, 20 years of my life until um, I didn't need it anymore because I realized what I was doing wrong and I wasn't uh, going to be straining my voice in certain ways. And doing warm ups are good. Um, I don't do them anymore. And I think it's because I, I come to the, to the, to the, to the show already relaxed, I guess. I, I don't know how else to put it and already sort of pacing myself. And I know when I, and if I do anything that is really straining my voice, you stop and start again. You can, you know, you have full control. So, but yeah, there was a time I had Roger Love as a vocal cord, not to have sort of interrupt you, but he's no, the guy that I got rudely that. interrupted you. No, no, it's okay. He's the guy that started me on the whole goo, 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 And I learned all about chest voice and falsetto, which is this. Yeah. And most guys, when they're doing a woman's voice, and for comedic purposes, of course, will do that. They'll go into falsetto. How are you, mom? Oh, I'm doing fine. Like 
Monty Python. But there, the female voice is actually upper chest. So it's it's up here, you see. And when we do when you do it up here, it starts to get scary. I sound like a woman, don't I? Because I can see the fear in your eyes. And no, uh, uh, I, I was going to say the jerky boys, I think, refined the women impression that the Salzburg <laughs> impression i don't know if you're familiar with the jerky boys i'm sure sure. you know, yeah. but uh, john brennan has said that that was just an impression of his mom the sal rosenberg and you go oh yeah that's not falsetto so that's who i'm doing i'm doing my mother exactly you channeling your mom and my mother was like, oh philip you're gonna wear that you look god you know so so when i learned about upper chest falsetto how to really get the upper chest that's where we warm up you know uh, darren you just Go, 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 go. If you get as high as you can in your upper chest voice, you've done a real good warm up, and then you can kind of fly from there. You know, it's just so emasculating to have to do that in front of other people. That's probably why you don't want to do it in the studio. Uh, yeah, well, I do it in the studio because the only thing, look, my cat's staring at me, and the cat, you know, what a cat, they just go, uh huh. Um, sometimes I'll do it, you know, in public, just burst out doing it in the middle of a supermarket. Yeah, and everybody moves away from you, and that's the end of that. You know. so another point of curiosity for me about your career is being an East Coaster, living in New York most of my life. I unfortunately learned about Howard Stern way before I learned about you. Like I, I saw your work as an actor and a voiceover person before mm -hmm. I knew that you were this radio legend. Is that a common thing that you've encountered with East Coasters? Oh, I don't know. I I, I really don't know, uh, to be honest with you. I, I see the comments on, our do on the documentary, people saying... I first heard him in Miami or I first heard him in LA or I really don't know. I mean, uh, we weren't on the air in New York for very long, if at all. I think, yeah, we were on a small station in New York. We weren't on in Philly, Philadelphia for very long, if at all. I think the show's syndication sort of uh, got as far as Chicago, the South, a little bit of some the upper Midwest, that kind of thing. So I, I don't know, man. I mean, I think um, most of the people that know me from the radio are people from the South or the West um where i had most of my success and then uh, um i don't know what was your question again oh did people east coast know me you know the only people on the east coast that know me and then i really east coast they're in toronto are my relatives you know my my aunt gladys she listened to me when i was on i was on a toronto station for two years interesting so, yeah, interesting. Just, that's my that's my nephew there okay yeah that's great glady more orange juice all right you know so so where i'm going with that is that mm -hmm. The internet actually, while terrestrial radio was dying, as you pointed out in 06 and around then, the internet kind of exposed you to a lot of people. And then this documentary, oh. there's still room to expose you to people, even though millions of people are familiar with your work. Yeah, that's a good, oh, there's a good point. So I had this radio show and you you know, Darren, I was uh, pretending to be a certain character and I had people call and talk to the character. Yeah. That was the radio show that has a stone crazy cult following. All yes. its own. And then there's the people who found the digital show that I do, and they have their love of me that, through that show. Um, and I was gratified in the documentary. I don't mean to drop any names. But why not? Uh, Henry Rollins says, and, and he said something that I really liked. He said, you know, I think a show now is funnier than the, than the radio show, which I, I personally agree with, you know, because I was really, when I was doing the radio show, I had to really struggle to make this all, all these pieces fit together every night. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, I think the people and it's always a, it's always an argument. The people, the old school listeners will tell the new school listeners, nah, you ain't heard nothing till you heard the radio show. This stuff yeah. he's doing up now, forget it. The old one, that's good. You know, I, I think the key is longstanding career. You're still great from my perspective. So Thank two you. more questions or topics. And well, where did you hear? Where'd you, you're from the East. So where'd you hear about me? Just. Uh, well, I saw your name on the credits of a lot of things that I enjoyed, and then eventually oh, okay. down the Wikipedia rabbit hole, and you go, "He is oh, <laughs> He's I got a radio you. Okay. guy." I didn't know that. Yeah. And then you hear this art where you go, "It's the exact opposite of what you did in all these Apatow and Mike Judge and et cetera projects." And True. you go, "That's fascinating that you can have these dual careers." I guess I could compare it in a in a weird way to Adam Carolla, who yeah. basically had his radio career through Loveline and the syndicated show. And that has almost nothing to do with what he's doing now. Stuff. Yeah. His podcast now is a stone smash success. And also Adam has some similar roots to me. I think he worked in construction work before he got into radio. You know, that's, that was the same thing for me too. You know, so the short yeah. list of you, Harrison Ford, Adam. <laughs> the short list. So Adam, 
um, had a, had love lines. Yeah. And he had that presence on K rock here in Los Angeles and his association with Jimmy Kimmel. But yeah, the podcast is the, is the monstrosity, man. That's the, the, the that's the, the big engine, you know, of his career. The two questions that I got before I let you go. The first one, I don't know if this is a 10 second answer or 10 minute answer, whatever you want, whatever you'll give me is fine. So you're in a career where you're basically talking to yourself with multiple personalities at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I loved the stand-up act of Otto and George. I don't know if you knew Otto and George, but it was basically an X-rated ventriloquist dummy who was berating the ventriloquist. And that's just two voices. But sometimes <laughs> you're doing three and four and talking to yourself as a crazy person. How yeah. do you decompress when you come off the air? Well, you just don't talk. You stop talking. You know, you don't talk to anybody. I mean, it's probably one of the problems with my marriage. You know, I would get off the air and my wife would want to talk for three hours. And I'm just like, I can't. There's nothing more. I would go and I would try to hide. You know, I'd go into an office and just. But I, it, it's not anything really mysterious. You stop working and you go upstairs or you go to wherever you go back home and you pour a drink or you have a, a molded milk or something or you pet the cat. And do something else like for me. Um, I'll flip on the tube and watch Drive to Survive, watch some, you know, auto racing, or I'll watch, um, I don't know, you know, just news or um, sometimes I do a, a video log that goes along with the shows. And that's kind of fun for me to just talk as myself, you know, and get back to being fit. Well, here's what I did today. And this is what I think about that. And here's the real thing behind it. And that's sure. fun for me to tell the audience, here's what I was thinking when I was doing the show today. And uh, Getting back to the reality of, you know, well, it's performance, so let's talk about the performance, you know. The last question, uh, his name has come up a few times in this conversation, Henry Rollins, legendary punk vocalist, hardcore vocalist, before he became a successful actor and voiceover guy and all that. Is there any Henry Rollins music that you actually listen to? I, I know which music I listen to. When I'm Henry, crazy. after he left Black Flag, uh, after he left Black, and he was doing his performance kind of art music, I remember that music. When when Henry was in Black Flag, regrettably, I was in the throes of my album rock disc jockey career. And all we were playing back then was, well, let's see, the early 80s, it, we'd have been, you know, dancing in a Def Leppard and the Babies and, and God, I don't know what, you know, but we did not play punk music. Man. The K-Rock did here in LA. They were the punk punk rock station right but unfortunately i really got to know henry after his music career and i saw him like you know you see somebody on television you listen to what they say you find out how really smart they are yeah and not that you never doubted that they'd be smart you find out just how widespread his interests are how how much of an interest he had in media and uh and the fact that he listened to me which i thought was a stone i was really flattered man so um you know and 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 henry uh in fact he told me that when he was in the heat he had to audition for Al Pacino, out the actor, you know, not the producers yeah. for Al Pacino. And I said, dude, that's, I think that's pretty tough. You know, congratulations for surviving that. Yeah, Pacino probably said, like, he's okay. I'll take him. All we're doing, we're throwing him against the wall. So who cares? You know. <laughs> so, so what I'm taking away is when you and Henry talk, you're not talking about punk rock. You're talking about everyday stuff. <laughs> yeah. And I get the sense that, uh, well, I've only spoken with Henry a couple of times. You know, one time I interviewed him for a Bobby Dooley podcast where he talked to Bobby Dooley. And then another time uh, uh, I saw him commenting on the on the thing. No, and I, I don't think he'd want to. You know, he doesn't strike me as a guy who say, come on, let's talk about my career and my music. You know, I think he's a cat that so uh, has such a diverse uh you know the landscape of interests um you could talk to that cat about anything i think well thank you for the decades of great art congrats thank on this you. documentary and looking forward to whatever's to come from you whether it is the quote mainstream stuff or you being multiple personalities at the same time i love it phil oh thanks brother i appreciate it uh, being on thank you for asking me outro cast <laughs>